Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're just going to give it sort of like 30 seconds or so um, just because the live streaming does take a little bit longer and people logging on. Um, so we're just waiting for a couple more people to join. Um, but it's really great that you can join us this afternoon um, and look at this really interesting um, case study topic. Okay, I think everybody's on now. So fantastic. My name is Karen. I work for Discover the World Education as an education manager and Icelandic school guide. Um, prior to working here, I was head of department and pastoral deputy for over 25 years. And I continue to be fascinated, actually, by different places, how they've grown to be, particularly looking at how different influences actually impact those places. And also, of course, the people that live within them. Um, I really believe that connections are at the heart of geography um, and really form the heart of this particular topic. Today, we're going to look at a town in southwest Iceland called Quebergurdi. Um, it's a town that I've visited many times and actually would be my town of choice if I'm ever fortunate enough um, to move and live in Iceland. At the moment, obviously, that's, that's rather a, a dream rather than the reality. Um, as you can see, um, I've got my video on. I'm going to turn it off in a minute so that you can see the full slides. You can also see that I have my colleague Kat with me um, today. She's in charge of the chat box. So if you have any questions at all during the webinar, please do let me know um, and I'll try and answer them um, as we go through. Or if not, we can we can have just a couple of minutes at the end where we can have some questions. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint afterwards, then please do let me know. Um, we also have some resources at the end that you can gather um, from our website. Um, they're completely free to download um, and you can use them with your students. Um, and we'll, we'll look at those at the end and as we move through as well. OK, so I'm just going to turn my video off. OK, and let's get started. So evidence and research suggests that learning information about the geography of a country, just a basic information before introducing case studies, can really give the students a sense of place. It kind of generates an emotional connection to a place, which means that the knowledge and understanding of a case study will be greater and more memorable. It kind of triggers this connection. Sometimes we can't visit all the places that we want to study, you know, it'd be great if we could, um, but we can't. Um, but we want them to have an attachment to the place, which is their connection, it's their attachment rather than ours. I often find that when I'm talking about something with complete passion, the reason why I'm talking about it with passion is because I've been there and I've experienced it. And actually it's quite difficult for children, particularly adolescents, to sort of like grasp that connection, to grasp that emotional, it's just not there. So how can we introduce that country in order for the students to fully understand sort of like what you know they need to look at? You know, we need them to understand the impacts and the challenges that a country goes through because this will help understand the different case studies um, that we're looking at. We want them to know some fundamental facts, perhaps, about the population, where the population lives, what's the physical nature of the country, what's their economy like, what are they like as a country. Now, as we know, imagery is a great tool in this instance because it will generate an emotion. You know, these two pictures that I've chosen here, the one on the left-hand side, you know, people might look at that and they say, oh my God, you know, can we go there? That would probably be their first question. Um, but just looking at here, you can say, well, you know, you can walk behind this waterfall, you can see the fossils in the rock. You know, how do you think this cliff was formed? What do you think's out there? It really generates, them to have, be creative and develop that emotion. The picture here that I've chosen on the right hand side is of um, a farmer's daughter um, in the time of the Aeoflecklyerkler eruption, where you know they all the family went out to bring the sheep out from the fields to um, have them sheltered in the barns when the ash was falling down. And again, it's a powerful image and it will generate an emotion. And that emotion can then be tagged onto their learning. 
another old fashioned way, actually, it's, you know, when I first started training as a teacher some 25, 30 years ago, you know, we were taught about inquiry based learning, you know, and bottom line, it was like the projects that I did at school some time before then. I call mine TED. Um, you know, think, explore, discover. I use the octopus as a, a good analogy because I kind of think it's like the child reaching out or the student reaching out with all their different legs and arms and, and gathering all of this information. You know, they're exploring the topic, they're discovering about it. You know, if you were to give your students the topic Iceland, they go away and they find whatever they want to explore and discover on Iceland. It might be to do with the football, it might be to do with volcanoes, it might be to do with the egalitarian society that they have. Either way, they've triggered an emotion, a memory, which they can then tag and connect their case studies to. It's simple adolescent psychology. Um, and actually, if you look into the sort of like the more detailed psychology, it's a really important thing to install in your students. Another Im uh, image here of the, of the volcano. So let's give you some basic information about Iceland to get us started and prepare for our case study today. So Iceland is a large island in the centre of the North Atlantic Ocean. It's the only place above the ocean where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is visible. There are over 33 active volcanoes and several large glaciers and ice caps. Reykjavik is its capital, the most northern capital in the world, and their economy is mainly split between tourism, aluminium processing due to the abundance of renewable and cheap power, and fishing. It's an optimistic and resilient nation with a real community feel. They're fiercely independent, yet they are very, very welcome to visitors. They often appear in the top five of happiest nations and they have a fantastic work home life balance. You know, their equal rights are very high on the political and economical agenda and they have a really true egalitarian society. So hopefully that's given you some idea as to what sort of like the country and the people are like. If we look at the people, Iceland has a population of just 350,000 people, with 78% of these people living within this red circle here in the southwest corner. Cuevagerdi is within this red circle, and the internal migration, as well as the proximity to Reykjavik, are key influences and factors that we'll look at today in giving it sense of identity. Katrin Jakobsdottir is the current Prime Minister. She's a very forward-thinking lady with worldwide recognition for her work on equal rights for all, not just for women, but for everybody. Iceland has been inhabited since Viking times, with the first explorer Ingolf Arnason arriving in Smoky Bay, Reykjavik, in 874 AD. Iceland didn't have any permanent dwellings until the late 19th century, so in terms of the development of its town and the cultural identity of towns and villages in Iceland, they're actually quite new, which gives it the perfect opportunity for us to study them. It was then in the 19th century that towns and cities and, and villages that are in Iceland, that, you know, we, they then started to grow and develop. As we said, it's one of the top five happiest places to live. Last year, it was ranked number three. It has the top six ranking in the Human Development Index, and it has one of the top 10 life expectancies. The resilient and optimistic nature of the Icelandic population really links to how a small town like Cuevagerdi has developed over the years. And if we look at both the, the endogenous and the exogenous factors, we know from this information how this nation is actually quite unique. The saying Theteradast, which is an Icelandic saying that the Icelandic use quite regularly, um, and actually I've been using quite regularly and more over the last year, and I'm sure the Icelandic population have been using it a lot over the last year, it basically means it will all be okay in the end. And if you think about how this island has to cope with the unrelenting forces of nature, the harsh physical environment, and it's quite isolated location, they really are very resilient and quite optimistic. And they do have this true belief that it all will work out um, in the end. 
this saying that's on the screen now, this was actually written by Magnus Magnusson, who used to be one of the um, sort of presenters on Mastermind, actually. And, and he recognised the fact that, yes, they do have a very harsh and, and quite severe sort of like living conditions, yet they're a very progressive and modern society and actually a very strong economy. Um, and maybe in the future, because of its renewable energy resources, will actually be quite a, a power to be reckoned with um, in, in the future. OK, let's move on. So one of the things that the students will come across when they um, Google Iceland, because that's probably what they will do, is it's called the land of fire and ice. This definitely will come across. And this is great because the fire element of this sort of phrase that is used to describe Iceland is will link to one of the main endogenous factors influencing Quevagirdi. It will form a connection. So as soon as they see, oh, fire and ice, and then we talk about geothermal energy in Quevagirdi, it's then going to trigger this memory, make their learning more valuable. 10% of Iceland's land area is covered by ice caps and glaciers. The largest glacier mass in Europe is Vatniurkel in the southeast of Iceland. And in contrast, Iceland has over 33 active volcanoes and 10 of these are under the ice. It's quite a unique and rare tectonic process. Quevagirdi is a town of some 2,400 people in the rural southwest of Iceland. It's a little less than an hour's drive from the capital Reykjavik. It's known as Iceland's green town, and you can see why from the image on the screen. And it's famous from its, for its steam geysers, bubbling mud pools, forests and greenhouses. Indeed, what makes Quevagirdi special is it's one of only a few towns in the world, geothermal towns in the world, it's rather less well known as a town of artists, writers and poets. Now, Quevagirdi is an excellent focus for a study of the endogenous and exogenous factors that shape a place. It's undergone considerable change in terms of how it's perceived both by local people and by the people all across Iceland. And its functions, as well as its place, I mean, for people over time, it's really transformed. So it really is quite interesting to investigate at A-level. It also lends a fantastic topic to look at critical thinking, to actually start looking at, you know, well, actually, could they have done it this way? Are they doing the right thing? Just get those students to think outside the box just a little bit. So a little bit more in an overview of Quevagirdi before we look more specifically at some of the internal and external factors. Quevagirdi has undergone a considerable amount of rebranding and re-imaging in recent years as a result of people's changing perceptions of the risks and rewards particularly associated with geothermal activity. In the early days, people actually regarded this area as quite highly dangerous and there are areas quite close to the town that are highly dangerous. And for this reason, the area was known locally as the Killing Springs. However, opinion shifted and the benefits of plentiful hot water started to really outweigh the potential dangers. People made use of the hot water in daily chores, washing and cooking, and the constant flow of the river Varmau enabled electricity to be generated, powering quite a rudimentary woolen industry. But the hot water now heats greenhouses, that enabled flowers and vegetables to be cultivated. And by the mid 20th century, Quevagirdi had then become quite a thriving small settlement. Today, Quevagirdi is still renowned for its plants. It's promoted by the tourist board as Iceland's green town. And the influx of artists and poets in the 1940s gave the town another dimension, which it also retains today. There are art galleries and street art on some of the town's buildings. Now, more recently, as we know, tourism in Iceland has really sort of like springboarded to a major success. And we'll look at this in a minute as an exogenous reason. But because it's located on Iceland's main ring road, 
less than an hour from Reykjavik, Quevagurdi provides opportunities for visitors to experience both the real Iceland out of the city, because the effects of globalisation aren't quite so paramount here, as well as looking at the features associated with geothermal activity. And popular activities in the area, you can go hiking, you can go horse riding, fantastic hot streams and pools. You can actually do this amazing hike, the Reykjadala Valley hike, where you walk up the warm river and you get to the top and you can actually swim in the river. Swimming is a slight over sort of exaggeration because if you go into this river, to be honest, it goes literally just above my knees. I'm not very tall. It literally goes above my knees. But you can still do that. And what an amazing thing to be able to do. You can visit the geothermal area, which is in the centre of Quevagurdi. You can have your dinner cooked on sort of like the earth because they promote earth cooking in the local restaurants. And this town is fast becoming a vibrant honeypot site. The town plan, however, is to develop this town from not just being a stop off tourist honeypot, but actually into a health town. And we'll talk about this later in the webinar. So Quevagurdi is located in the centre of the South Iceland seismic zone at the foot of an upland range and sheltered by a steep cliff face. The landscape of central Iceland is riven by faults and ruptures because the Earth's crust has split along the constructive plate margin. As you probably know, recent isostatic recovery after the last glacial period has resulted in emergent features such as, such as the relic cliffs in the background of this photograph on the bottom left. These cliffs provide shelter for the town from the no cold northerly winds. And then you've got this extensive coastal, coastal plain stretching out in front of the upli, uh, upland plateau, which is essentially a vast raised marine platform resulting from isostatic recovery. This has enabled the town to grow and expand, particularly over the last 30 years. As you can see from this photograph, there's plenty of space to expand. It's flat. The land is good, it still has the river, and it's sheltered by this sort of like upland area. Geothermal activity characterises this part of southern Iceland as steam and hot water, as you can see from the top right, it sort of like escapes the surface along cracks and fissures in the surface rocks. And water is seeping underground. It's heated by those hot rocks, which are very, very close to the surface. This accounts for the hot springs, geysers and mud pools that are currently in Quevagurdi. And there are several geothermal power stations, for example, Heckless Hady, in the vicinity, which exploit this geothermal activity in generating electricity. The river Farmau has eroded a steep sided valley with waterfalls and rapids. In the early, early 20th century, people's fear of the hot springs subsided because they started to see these potential benefits and also those opportunities that present by having naturally occurring hot water. The first development took place on the banks of the river Farmau that flows through the present day town. Unlike most rivers in Iceland, the Varmel did not freeze in the winter. It was a consistently flowing river because of obviously the flow of geothermally heated water from the tributaries. This meant that it had the potential to be a power source throughout the year. Now, this uniqueness led to the development of a small scale industry in the form of this wool factory, which used electricity generated by the river. This sparked the first permanent settlement of Quevagurdi. It was built on the banks so that they could then use the water in both sort of like the electricity as well as in terms of the wool processing from the wool from the Icelandic sheep that was obviously on the land areas below. The electricity was generated at the nearby waterfall and this very early sort of like rustic um, sort of mill as such remained open until 1914 so it was open for around about 11 years. 
Now, back in 1914, there weren't many trees in Iceland. So in this particular picture where you've got the trees on the edge of the river, these are actually being planted quite recently. They have a massive tree planting program in Iceland at the moment in an attempt for their carbon neutral um, status. So these trees have been planted quite recently, mainly to prevent soil erosion and um, stabilizing the slopes on the edge of this particular river. So that gives you some idea of um, the physical geography. Let's look at the geothermal energy. The generation of electricity from the river was instrumental in the growth and development of the town from the 1930s. In fact, Cueva Gerdi was the first town to have electric lighting in rural Iceland. So after Reykjavik, actually, Cueva Gerdi was the first town to have um, electric lighting. The early settlers made use of the naturally occurring hot water to carry out daily tasks like washing and cooking. And bread, known as lava bread, not very sort of like original with their, um, or creative with the names of their products here, but the bread known as lava bread was cooked in the ground together with the boiling of eggs and potatoes and other vegetables, which would be put in linen bags and then put in the, um, the hot pools. This practice continues for tourists. You can see here a picture of um, a tourist, a little girl here, um, actually boiling some eggs. But I do know, and I have friends and um, people who live locally in Iceland who do still bake bread, particularly on the Western Islands, where you can go and sort of like find little hot spot areas in the volcano um, and you leave it for sort of like five or six hours and then they go back and they, and they find their bread. So it still does go on even today. So let's have a look at the killing springs. Um, and it always makes me laugh, the killing springs, you know, they're only gonna kill somebody if you, if you go in them. But actually, you know, as long as you respect the nature and the Icelandic people are very, very sort of like, they have a strong belief in this, you know, the nature is there, it is important and you have to respect it. But the name of the town that was first used in around about 1700, it wasn't really a town, was Killing Springs. And it was really only a name for the hot spring, hot spring area. There was no settlement here in the 1700s. As we said, it didn't really start until sort of like the 1900s. And whilst today its geysers and mud pools are central to its character and economy, the local people feared the area in the past. And the name coined for the springs reflect, reflect the stories of accidents that happened. Um, you know, people didn't have an understanding of how dangerous they were. So yes, they did um, kill people and sheep, you know, in previous times. What was significant here is there was an earthquake in 2008, and this really was quite significant for the town. And it really has generated a huge interest in the town in terms of where, you know, its development. Because although it only measured 6.1 on the Richter scale, it didn't cause sort of like any death. It did cause injuries and there were damage to buildings, but it really impacted on the geothermal activity. And the hot spring areas and effusions in the centre of Cueva Gerdi disappeared. But new springs in the hills actually all sprung up and more of them actually. And to some extent, this has kind of changed the way the town is developing because they now feel that more development can happen in the town because the hot springs have shifted in terms of their location. It also has impacted for the tourism because they have built new paths and walkways and hiking towns and access to areas of the hot springs and of these hot spring areas and it's slightly away from the town. Um, it's around about a kilometre and a half. So therefore, the town's plans in terms of development for the future and in terms of its actual identity are changing and they definitely changed in 2008. Quevergurdi, as we said, is well known as Iceland's greenhouse capital. There is nothing better than driving from Reykjavik and you're coming along those highland areas and you come round the corner and you sort of like overlook Quevergurdi. And I always say, you know, I'm coming home. It is 
there is a glow and it's from the greenhouses because the greenhouses are basically lit and heated 24 seven. So even if you come down at night, you have this amazing golden glow from the greenhouses of this small town below you. And then you come down this sort of like sweeping road into the plain, um, which is obviously the sort of like the flat area below. Um, and then you're immersed within this town. But it's well known as Iceland's greenhouse capital and it cultivates an extraordinary range of fruit and vegetables, which enables Iceland to be actually virtually self-sufficient in a number of products that they used to be very reliable on just in terms of imports. So things like tomatoes, strawberries, cucumbers, peppers, mushrooms, some of the salad, other crops that we, we enjoy with our salad, they are in abundance. And just, to, I think it was about four years ago, actually some of the areas um, around this particular area that are tomato farms actually had too many tomatoes and therefore they actually exported tomatoes. So when you think you've got a country or an area that has a growing season of only four months, the fact that they were able to export sort of like a, a crop, which generally only happens where countries have sunshine and heat, um, is just incredible. Now, some greenhouses, most notably the Garden of Eden, which was constructed in 1958, even managed to grow tropical crops such as bananas. Um, and they had a pineapple sort of like mini plantation within that. Unfortunately, um, this particular greenhouse was destroyed by fire in 2011. But even so, prior to that time, tourists used to come to Quevagirdi. So before the real tourism boom, um, we, you know, we still had visitors to Quevagirdi. So they're kind of used to tourism, which other people and other towns and villages in Iceland weren't. Now, gardening and greenhouses have had a huge influence on the nature of this town and its sense of identity. There's an annual flower festival. There's a flower ball dedicated to the, flat, the floral heritage of the town. And the Iceland Horticultural School, the Agricultural College, is actually located within the town and on the slopes just outside. So it really is an important part of the town. Now we've talked about the proximity to Reykjavik and it, I think it's it's one of the reasons why Quebagurdi has seen quite a lot of growth um, really for the last sort of like 50, 60, 70 years. Um, Quebagurdi is easily accessible from Reykjavik. It's only 40 minutes, 45 kilometres and it's on this main road. There's only one road really, main road in Iceland, road one they call it. Um, there are obviously a few other roads but road one is the main road and Quevergurdi as you can see from this map it actually sits on the main road between Reykjavik and Selfoss. Um, it is actually the the busiest section of the road um, it is the busiest area and it's a it's an area that they often keep open because of the sort of like the logistics and communications around Iceland. Selfoss is the municipal town of the south of Iceland. It's sort of like second, it, you know, it's got about 8,000, 9,000 people. So it's a very important town. Um, obviously Reykjavik is its capital. So Quevagodi sits in the middle. So, you know, it really is fantastic location in terms of everybody goes past it. Um, moving on just from that then to some of the facilities that they have in um, Quevagirdi because it kind of links to the proximity to Reykjavik. Now the naturally occurring hot springs they haven't just provided heat and power for the people of the town but they've also provided hot water for the town's swimming pool and if you've been to Iceland you will know that every town and village in Iceland has at least one swimming pool. Um, it really is a massive part of their culture, their lifestyle, everything and obviously they've got a, an abundance of hot water so they can have outdoor or swimming pools even with their climate the way it is. Um, now this particular swimming pool was first built in 1938 and then extended to 50 metres. You can see it is quite a large swimming pool in 1945 and it was the largest swimming pool in Iceland. It consequently has a huge draw to people in southern Iceland who wish to learn to 
to swim. And during the 1940s and 50s, young men from Reykjavik used to travel to Quevagurdi to learn to swim prior to joining the fishing fleets traveling in and out of Reykjavik. I'm saying young men because at the time it was young men that went out on the fishing boats. Now, historically, many fishermen have been lost to the sea, but there was this dreadful disaster in the 1930s when actually a lot of young men, sort of like 15, 16, 17, 20 year olds, went out um, on a huge shipping um, and fishing trip. Um, and unfortunately, there was an unexpected storm and many of the ships were lost. And you can read dreadful sort of stories about how a generation of fishermen were lost. Because of that, in 1940, a law was passed, which basically meant that all children have to be taught to swim. It's a key part of their school curriculum and also in terms of their leisure and recreation time. As I said, most towns and villages actually do have a swimming pool. Now, fishing is a fundamental and valuable part of Iceland's economy. And even though Quevagurdi isn't on the coast, it still does remain an important place for people to still learn to swim. And, and they do still focus on this in this particular town. You know, fishing, 11% of the Icelandic economy in 2018. And it, it's hard to overstate the importance of fish and the fishing industry to the Icelandic people. You know, through the centuries, it's been a lifeline to the nation, both in terms of its food supply and also its chief export product. Um, and historical evidence suggests that the story of Icelandic fish export dates back to the 12th century at the very least. Um, you know, and, and hot tubs, swimming pools, they're an Icelandic institution. If you don't enjoy hot tubs and swimming pools when in Iceland, you haven't experienced the full Icelandic sort of, you know, nature. Let's look at internal migration, but particularly the artist movement. Now, this is something that I love about Quevagurdi because you can really see the influence when you're walking around the town. Um, in the 1940s, the artists and poets established in Reykjavik started to relocate to Quevagurdi because they were in search of better living and working conditions. And being just an hour away from the capital, Quevagurdi represented a quieter and more reflective locality. Now, this cultural movement grew and increasing numbers moved into the town, creating a small artistic colony on its western side. And this is actually called Poet Lane or Frunskalga. This influx contributed significantly to the development of Quevagurdi in terms of not simply the number of people, but also the creation of its cultural character. And this in turn has had an impact on the wider place identity right the way across Iceland. Now, the poets who moved to Quevagurdi in 1940 which coincidentally was the year that Iceland was occupied by the British army and the following years, did so to find better conditions than they had lived in during the depression before World War II. They had heard that heating was cheap, that cooking took place on the hot springs itself, and there was a great shortage of housing in Reykjavik during this time, and the families were forced to live very close together. There was something seductive about living in a small peaceful village known for growing flowers and vegetables. Now, there was a trio of famous and talented artists and poets who often worked together on their projects and they wrote the first poem on Quevagurdi. And each verse concluded with the words, Quevagurdi is the best place in the world. Now, this community atmosphere and ethos still remains very strong in the town. The artistic legacy also remains strong. Street art and the presence of a number of art galleries are significant in this location, even to somebody like me, the very casual observer. Um, and you can see here the modern day art that is allowed to appear on the sides of certain buildings within Quevagurdi. Now let's now look at the major exogenous factor. Well, I think it is, but you know, tourism. Now tourism has grown exceptionally quickly in Iceland over the last few years. It was springboarded um, by the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010, with numbers increasing by 30% between 2015 and 2016 to well over 1 million tourists a year, about four times the population of the country. And in 2018, it was recognised that 
Iceland actually received around about 2 million visitors. Now, if you want to know more about AF Lekvierkel and the impact of that on the tourism industry, please do sort of like dip in to my other webinar, which looks at sort of like AF Lekvierkel in terms of a geographical perspective, because I can give you lots of information about that. Um, I'll give you information as to where you can access that if you haven't seen it already. In 2018, we know that tourism started to plateau and actually decrease. Um, but with the desire to visit more remote, peaceful places, even more so now, I believe, because of the global situation that we're in, we are anticipating, and the Icelandic Tourist Board are also anticipating a real rebound of numbers to somewhere around what they had in 2015 and 16 um, in 2022 and beyond. Iceland is now very accessible by air. It's no longer seen as an extreme destination and it attracts people from all over the world to see the Northern Lights in winter, as well as some of the extraordinary landscapes. Now, Cuevagodi, as we know, it's situated on Iceland's main ring road, quite close to Reykjavik. So it is well placed to attract tourists who want to see this geothermal area, try out the earth cooking in the town's restaurants, or just basically enjoy the different landscapes. There are now several hotels and guest houses in and around Cuevagodi that exploit the town's geothermal legacy. And they've got hot tubs and swimming pools and spas and different areas for relaxation. It's a colorful, thriving settlement now, and it's got a very balanced economy and a very rich culture. It's become quite a popular tourist attraction with loads of opportunities for different walking and um, other activities like the mountain biking and horse riding. Now, Quivergird, as we said, it's always had tourists because of the horticulture and because of its proximity to Reykjavik. And the town's plan, which we will look at, does plan to take advantage of increased tourist numbers, but in a very sustainable and sympathetic way. And I think it's wonderful. And I, be I believe that it won't affect the identity of the town too much, um, just because they are being proactive rather than being reactive to what is going to happen. I just want to share with you the attractive map um, here, which um, you can download sort of like from our website, but you can see how tourist friendly it is. And this is something that they really are quite proud of. You can get this in every hotel, every shop, the petrol station in Quevergurdy as well. And it's clearly intended to encourage tourists to spend a little bit of time in the town. They don't want to be just this stop off place where you go to the bakery. Don't get me wrong, the Quevergurdy bakery is amazing. They have the best cinnamon buns and wonderful coffee but there is more to Quevergurdy than just that and so therefore by giving um, the tourists something like this which shows very clear details of where different experiences can happen you're encouraging tourists to spend just a little bit more time. You can see that it is going to play quite a, a role in the economic future of the town. They don't want to be just reliant on the horticulture. They don't want to be just reliant on people coming to use the swimming pool. They actually want people to spend money. OK, so you can see here from the map that they've got information boards, they've got trails, hiking paths, gardens, hot springs. You can see they're the shopping centre. They're encouraging you to do the Rekidala hike which I really would recommend that if you ever get the chance to go to Iceland, please do do that because it is incredible. So pretty simple and just amazing. The views expressed on a website like TripAdvisor and images on social media sites like Instagram are incredibly influential. And I actually just um, did a bit of research on my Instagram page, actually, and I looked at Quevergurdy and they have really promoted sort of like, you know, share your images of Quevergurdy. They want you to sort of like share the different things that you can do and the different experiences that you can have, because, the, you know, the you, if you're getting international tourists, the footfall and the, and the visitor, that those sort of like spends, they really shape the economic prosperity of not just the hotels, but the food outlets, the shops, you know, the hiking trails where you sort of like, you know, you might take a guide to take you up this particular trail. Um, you know, if you if you stay in the town, you're going to spend money in the town. So, as I said, they've been very proactive towards tourists and visitors, but try to remain sustainable wherever possible. 
Now, an interesting critical think question here could be the, the economy of the town and whether actually they are becoming a little bit too reliant on an industry like tourism that we know is very fragile. And they will have really experienced that in the last year with receiving very, very few international visitors. But the use of the pool by the Reykjavik fishing industry, the influx of tourists, the migration of the artists, the poets, those seeking a peaceful, tranquil setting, they all combine to give us evidence that actually its proximity to Reykjavik is quite an important exogenous factor in Crevagode's development and culture. I want to now focus on the demography of and the population that actually are in Crevagurdi. This is actually expanding by over 2% per year. It's increased from sort of like 1,760 in 2000 to 2,481 in 2017. And this indicates that the town is quite popular. It's also indicative of the fact that it is an economically viable town and it is sustainable. There's quite a good gender balance. It is 50-50, near enough, okay? And the age structure suggests that there are equal levels of dependency between young and old. There's a healthy 62% of people in working age, and that suggests long-term sustainability and economic viability for the town. The age profile bars that you can see at the bottom here, they indicate a high number of people in their 50s, but it's actually balanced quite well by a high proportion also in their 20s. And I think that demography would seem to be an important endogenous factor because it will shape the character of Quevagurdi. It's broadly balanced demography with some older retired people who will probably be keen to retain the town's historical heritage, as well as the younger people who will be keen to promote new initiatives. And I hope that they continue to find balance in that. I want to look now at the town's plan so you can see what they have planned and what the future looks like for Quevergurdi. And I hope you will see that the sort of like the population, the, the sort of like the demographic structure um, has really paid a big influence in this. So in 2015, and I know that they're looking at this again, Quevergurdi community the Quevagodi community, sorry, shared their plans and objectives for the future. And a few of the goals for the new Quevagodi town proposal were to create a sustainable society with the usage of geothermal energy, something that's been around for a long time, strengthen the images of Quevagodi as a town of greenhouse farming and organic cultivation, again, something that's historically. They want to densify the centre area in a human scale in harmony with the existing town space and not change the nature of the buildings too much. And you can see quite a forward thinking building here on the right hand side. But you can see they've used natural products. They've gone alongside with the greenhouse sort of effect and then also strengthen the image of Quevagurdi as a town of health and tourism. Um, now, the Icelandic Nature Health Society runs the rehabilitation and health clinic in Quevagurdi, and you can see this on the top left-hand image here. The clinic was actually founded in 1955, and at first it started to accommodate sort of like 40 guests, but now over 2,000 guests visit this clinic every year. And by locating the clinic in Quevagurdi, an area of intense geothermal activity, the clinic has had the opportunity to develop different services to the people who started to visit here. They have organic greenhouse vegetables and fruit. It's the first organic cultivation stations in Iceland. And actually now, the sort of like the crops that come from these cultivation stations actually make up sort of like around about 50% of the vegetables and fruit that are actually served to the people, not only in the clinic, but also in the Quevagurdi area. The clinic is also open to the public um, as well. So you can go and visit the spa and people do that. And you can buy special treatments such as the geothermal mud bath, where you get to soak in hot mud for 15 minutes. Um, and then you can sort of like bathe in the geothermally heated water. Um, and it really is quite a special place. Now, next to the health clinic, they have actually developed the site and there are now a number of buildings. There are townhouses and apartment blocks just 
two storey high because obviously they do suffer from earthquakes here. And you can either go and stay in these apartments or actually you can now buy them as well. And people that buy these apartments and houses actually are able to use the spa and use the geothermal sort of things that they offer. It comes as part of the contract. And these are encouraging people over the age of 50 um, and also people who have got health problems and maybe the elderly. So it's a bit like a sort of a nice spa retirement village and this is really sort of like starting to sort of spread amongst Quevergurdy which is the reason why when we looked at the demography sort of like earlier you know there's a slightly higher number of um, people over the age of 50. So I hope that's given you some ideas of what's going to happen in the future and I think it will be interesting um, to watch this place because I do think it is a wonderful place to study, um, not just now and not just sort of like before, but actually as it develops even further, it will be a great place to study as well. So we're just going to look at some of the sort of like, let's bring it all together in terms of the different things, the internal, external factors which impact the identity. So if we look at the geology, you know, it's on a constructive plate margin. You've got the processes going on. It's primarily geothermal activity. But, you know, this was initially feared by the local people, but then offered opportunities for horticultural re recreation and tourism. And the hot springs are really central to the town's character. The recent earthquake in 2008 actually even sort of like gave it more reason as to why this is central to the character of the place. In terms of the topography, we know that the steep cliff face and the uplands to the north provide shelter for this town and the coastal plain provides extensive land for development in the future. And this enables the town to spread out so that you can have quite low density housing and that will really affect um, the town in the future. In terms of the geomorphology, you've got the River Varmau, which is flowing all year due to the hot springs. This is really important in terms of the electricity generation. And as we know, it was one of the triggers that started off the development of the town back in the early sort of 1900s. This has now got a steep sided valley where you've got leisure activities, recreation, walking and hiking. Then, of course, we've got the demography, which I think is a really important endogenous factor in shaping the character of Quevergurdy. It's a broadly balanced demography with some older retired people. They're keen to retain the town's heritage. And then you've got the younger people who are probably keen to promote new initiatives. And then, of course, you've got the proximity to Reykjavik, this rapidly developing and globalised city, which could influence Quebecordia's future development. And this, again, could be a good topic for some further debate and critical thinking. And of course, we have tourism. Um, you know, it has had a significant effect on towns like Quebecordi. And I think this is an important consideration in terms of its development and growth. OK, we have a video available on our website. It's called Quebecordi, a case study of a changing place. It's a nine minute short video, which I'm sure you have found really useful. It's presented by Simon Ross who actually does go to Quevergurdy and talks to some people in Quevergurdy, as well as there's some fantastic drone and video footage of some of the areas that I have talked about. You will also find a lot of lesson ideas from Cross Academy, and they've got great question and answer resources as well as lesson ideas. And actually much of the information in this presentation is also within the um, resources from Cross Academy. Um, I've just put it into a PowerPoint type lesson, but you will see that there are lesson ideas there. There's some questions that you might want to use with your students, some great resources and images that will spark that connection, that emotion. Um, there's some great exemplar exam questions and then some further thoughts on discussions for the future. So. As I said, if you go onto our website, you click on um, the study trips and then you can go into resources, changing places, Quevergurdy, and you will see that there are links to all of these resources there. 
As I said earlier, before we do actually have quite a few webinars um, now, they're all free of charge, either through um, our website or you can see some of them through the YouTube channel as well. We've got some that are very much CPD like this one, which are focused towards sort of teachers. But also we do have some revision webinars which are really useful for your students independent study um, and they are also sort of quite bite sized they're about 40 minutes long um, you know they kind of go through some of the stuff that they need to know for their GCSE and A level and then some of them actually look at um, questions and how they can get sort of more detailed and, and higher marks and stuff like that so please do take a look at those and again you know um, if you need any information just email me um, my email is very, very easy and you will find it on the website, no problem at all. And then finally, I just want to alert you to another webinar, which is next Monday at 4.30. Um, so same time as today, but on Monday. It's on Solheim Yerkel as a case study. Now, glaciation, I know, rather like changing places actually, is a voluntary topic at A-level, but I'm going to focus on glaciation but also a little bit about climate change as well um, and we're going to take Solheim Yerkel because it is one of the world's most monitored glaciers in the world and we have records dating back to the 1930s so looking at the retreat of this particular glacier looking at some of the landscape features um, that you can see in this area and we're going to look at some of the recent trends linking it to global warming um, and also I'll be providing sort of like new and informative resources and material that you can use with your students as well. So I can see that a, a few of you are asking for a copy of the presentation, which is absolutely fine. Um, if you could please email me, um, I will give you my email in just a minute. It's or maybe Kat can put it in the box for me. It is Karen at discover hyphen education.co.uk if you email me i can then send you a link to the presentation um, which you can use with your students um, that is no problem at all and if you have any other questions um, please do let me know i'll be very very happy to answer any of those questions um, in the meantime have a good evening um, you're doing an amazing job you really really are and um, you know we're all learning so very much particularly about how to be resilient when things are thrown at us um, at very short notice and um, it's been a pleasure to present to you this afternoon um, take care of yourselves and I look forward to seeing you very very soon thank you